Hello and welcome. My name's James Leeper. I'm an Associate Medical Director at uh, the British Heart Foundation. And it's my pleasure this afternoon to welcome you to the latest in our series of live and ticking events. At the British Heart Foundation, we've been delighted to be able to use this technology each month to bring you the latest BHF news uh, on our pioneering studies. And we thank you very much for your continued engagement and your continued support uh, of our life-saving research. I need to remind you all before we get cracking that the event is uh, being recorded and that you will be able to uh, ask questions of our speakers at the end of the, the session using the, the question and answer uh, window. So I just want to give you a quick overview of BHF News before we uh, get cracking with the main meat of uh, today's um, session. So as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a massive effect on, on research charities and our ability to fund life-saving research. In the last financial year, our uh, research spending was cut by approximately 50%, which of course means that we are only able to fund fewer uh, pioneering research studies uh, and conduct less life-saving research. And it is only really with the support of you, uh, our supporters, the general public, that we're able to continue our work. Before we uh, get into the subject of, of today's session, which is vascular dementia, I wanted just to give you some highlights from the British Heart Foundation over the last year. And I wanted to start by introducing our heart heroes. So as I said, the pandemic's been very difficult for everybody, but our heart heroes have have really pioneered the work in continuing to raise money for our life-saving research. And so we're recognizing these heart heroes in an incredible uh, event where all of you can nominate your local heart hero uh, through our webpage. Uh, nominations are open till the 31st of March uh, 21. Uh, so please do nominate anybody that you feel has been particularly active in, in supporting our great work uh, at the BHF. Moving on, I'd like to just name check uh, some of our fundraising heroes this month. And, and we don't have very much time. There are hundreds of people contributing to this activity. But I'd just like to, to say huge good luck to Jack, who's aiming to cycle at 1,084 miles. So the distance from Land's End to John O'Groats, doing this virtually. Uh, and so doing this at home to raise money for the BHF in, in memory of his mother. I think this is a fantastic virtual event for people to engage in. And so very best of luck, Jack, with that. Clearly Jack's taking on a massive challenge. Uh, and you know, we, we would like to encourage people to take on challenges to raise money for the British Heart Foundation. So perhaps those that are interested in cycling would like to visit the My Cycle uh, Challenge and join the cycling revolution to take on a virtual tour. And, and raise money at the same time for the British Heart Foundation. So the links are being pasted uh, at the moment to, to all of these sites, and hopefully those that are interested uh, will be able to find the information that they need. I'd like now just to move on quickly to the closure of our, our shops and stores. This has been a massive blow to the British Heart Foundation. And I think it's, it's underappreciated sometimes that we have a massive network of stores, 750 stores throughout the United Kingdom, uh, which raise valuable funds for our life-saving research. The shops are closed at the moment, but they are starting to reopen. And so the government in England has given a provisional date of the 12th of April for the opening of those shops. The dates vary slightly in, in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, but again, that information will be available on our website. So as those shops start to open, if you've been spring cleaning your housing and doing any renovations and you have unwanted items that you think may be valuable to others, please do donate them to our shops. You can also visit our Depop, our Depop shop online uh, and see uh, if there are items there that are of interest to you. So that's really uh, a news update from the British Heart Foundation. I'd like now to move on to the meat of our uh, event today, which is focusing on vascular dementia. And today I'm going to be joined by Professor Roxana Carrare from the University of Southampton, who's gonna be talking to us about her fantastic research. 
and also by Leslie Jackson, who has been diagnosed with vascular dementia and will be telling us a little bit about her story uh, managing this disease. But before we get started, uh, we'd like to do a quick poll to see how much you currently know about vascular dementia. So we've just launched a poll window there, which says, how much do you know about research into vascular dementia? So if you could rate this from one to five, uh, with one being very little and five being a lot. Uh, this is a live poll, so if you if you tick one of those boxes now, uh, then we'll be able to see what your starting level is uh, and whether over the course of the next three quarters of an hour uh, we, we can improve on that. So I've just got the, the poll results through and uh, the majority, the, the largest group uh, actually come uh, in with a score of one. So very little uh, knowledge about vascular dementia, 35% of you, and that stretches up to a score of four where 13% of you think that you, you have a reasonable understanding of vascular dementia. So our challenge this afternoon is to raise that, and we'll come back to that poll later on to see how we got on. So without further ado, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Roxana Carrere from the University of Southampton, who's going to speak to, her, to us all this afternoon. Uh, about her research activities. Thank you very much for this introduction. It's a hard act to follow. Um, and uh, mm. I, on behalf of my uh, team members, um, just a huge thank you for the uh, support from the uh, British Heart Foundation. So um, we've, our uh, group, our research group, um, focuses on finding new therapeutic strategies for different kinds of dementia, including vascular dementia. And what I'd like to start by is to continue this uh, poll exercise by asking people whether they are comfortable and confident in distinguishing between the terms dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and vascular dementia. So if you'd like to um, click whether you're confident in the differences between them, and then we'll come back to these questions at the end. Okay. Well, it's um, hopefully these uh, statistics will change. These percentages will change uh, by the end of my talk. Thank you very much. The term dementia is an umbrella term and it encompasses really the loss of cognition um, and behavioral changes. And the reason for that is if you look at the um, scans of uh, patients with dementia, you will see that the, the brain substance, the actual content of the brain substance is reduced. Um, a term that we call atrophy, but that happens in all types of dementia that you may have heard about, including vascular dementia. So as you can see here on the left, um, the brain uh, substance has shrunk, the ventricles, the cavities within the brain with uh, um, CSF fluid are enlarged compared to a normal brain. So these behavioral and cognitive- uh, Roxana, if yeah. I could just interrupt a moment. I can't see your slides. Oh, well, that's no good then. Sorry, thank you. Um, so now I can't see anything. I hope you're all there, sorry. I can still see you, but- uh... Yeah, well, that's not interesting at all. <laughs> what I want you to see, is no oh dear um so i'm sharing my screen ah there's something coming that's it perfect we on yes you that now yes yes oh good okay you might just want to go on to slideshow well, this is what I'm trying to do, but it won't yeah. let me do it. Of course, it did it in there the you are. test. Haha, right. Okay. So, a trophic brain on the left, can you see it? Yes? 
Yeah. And normal right. brain on the right. Okay, good. And that's in all kinds of dementia. And with uh, dementia, of course, come all the deficits that we know about from behavioral cognitive deficits, um, even movement disorders and uh, a, a loss of, of um, uh, all sorts of, of uh, cerebral functions. Now, in vascular dementia, these losses occur because of strokes. Now we could have uh, one large stroke, as you can see here in the section of the brain in the middle, um, you can have a stroke that actually digs a hole in the brain, as you can see on the left hand side, or you can have lots of mini strokes, like on the section on the right hand side. So every little dark dot on this brain of this section of the brain are actually mini infarcts, mini strokes, they could be mini bleeds in the brain, or they could be mini blockages. And because of the fact that the brain essentially loses its blood supply, um, the uh, uh, brain substance is not properly perfused, it's not fed, and slowly functions are being lost. So here in the brain in, uh, that, that you've got in the middle, because of the location of where the stroke is, this particular patient had severe had paralysis essentially of their arms, legs, and face. But that, in time, um, in in the patients that survive a massive uh, stroke like this, will translate into uh, cognitive deficits. Now, there are more subtle changes as well. If you have mini strokes, um, like you have here on the left hand side, the darkish purplish dots, then the white matter, which is essentially the fibers that take information to the surface of the brain, these white matter fibers become rarefied. So they're, they're, they're basically big holes. The, su the, 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 the substance is being lost and therefore information cannot reach the cortex and it can't go away from the cortex. So that was vascular dementia. In Alzheimer's disease, what we have is the deposition of waste proteins in the brain. So these waste proteins are proteins that we all produce because the brain is a, is a metabolically active organ and they can deposit in the form of sticky plaques in the brain or in the walls of the blood vessels. And that is where I wanted to get to. Because when, it, when the waste deposits in the walls of the blood vessels, like you can see on this um, artery um, on the left-hand side from a patient with Alzheimer's disease, or at least diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, then the differences are very difficult, impossible to observe in the living patient, because essentially these blood vessels are also deprived of their function because you have all this waste building up in the walls. So that's in Alzheimer's disease, waste building up in the walls of the blood vessels. In vascular dementia, we have the fact that the blood vessel itself can bleed, and that can be of different causes, diabetes, hypertension, um, uh, hyperdyslipidemia, and all these are grouped under the metabolic group of diseases, and very important, of course, to, to treat, to prevent vascular dementia. But they are all part of the same spectrum, this umbrella term of dementia. And as you can see, in vascular dementia, the predominant feature is this infarct, the, the, uh, the, the loss of blood supply, whereas in Alzheimer's disease, which actually forms what, what clinicians think is 85% of the cases of dementia, as pathologists, we think differently, um, in that case, you have a lot of waste protein, whether it's a beta or tau, deposited in the walls of the blood vessels, 
but of course depriving them of their function. So in our group, what we've shown is that the normal pathways for the elimination of waste are actually along the walls of the blood vessels. And this is a very important message because what that means is that the blood vessel itself is not just a supplier of blood to the brain, but it's also a conduit for the drainage of waste from the brain. So it's a really important structure that we have to look after for uh, uh, during the life course, because the wall of the blood vessel has these tiny channels that change with age, they change with hypertension, they change with uh, diabetes and other cardiovascular risk factors, and then waste starts building up. So I repeat, clinically, it's very difficult to tell the difference because you cannot resolve with any of the methods that we have available now, whether it's waste buildup or whether it's mini strokes. What we can see are images like this. So Nevedita Agarwal is a, a, neuro, a neuroradiologist um, affiliated to our research group. And what you can see is just this diffuse white matter hyperintensity, as they call it, in stroke. Um, but of course, you cannot resolve the exact cause of whether it's buildup of waste, which is predominantly in Alzheimer's, or the mini strokes predominantly in vascular dementia. So what we did with the funding that we had from the British Heart Foundation, and we were incredibly fortunate because at that time, it was just the British Heart Foundation with the forward thinking that they have to recognize that um, uh, dementia is actually a vascular disease, part of the wider cardiovascular system. What we did without boring you with the details is we demonstrated that even in vascular dementia, there is a problem with eliminating waste. Of course there is, because if those blood vessels are blocked, then they're not going to function in both delivery of blood and removal of waste. Furthermore, in the white matter, which is where the radiologists see the changes, like I showed you in the previous uh, slide, there's another problem which is under-recognized. The white matter doesn't have enough blood vessels. It doesn't have as many by far as the uh, gray matter does. And therefore, if you deprive the white matter of um, blood supply, even for a very short period of time, even just, just short transient ischemic attacks, it will suffer more. These nerve fibers will, will die and they will not be able to communicate efficiently with the surface of the brain. So what we showed in patients, so these are sections from patients who have died of vascular dementia, not Alzheimer's disease, or at least they were diagnosed with vascular dementia. So they have these white matter hyperintensities, um, abbreviated here as WMH. So what we demonstrated is that um, the changes in the white, in the whole of the white matter, not just the area that was affected by the, the mini strokes, are changes that, are, that we also see in Alzheimer's disease, where there, is, um, th there are modifications of the cement that keeps the cells together. That's what these proteins mean, the laminin and the fibronectin, they are um, proteins that make up what we call the extracellular matrix. So it's the cement that keeps all the cells together. And if that cement fails, then the communication between the cells also fails. And these changes are in through the entirety of the white matter. So what I'd like you to take away from this talk is that, um, the blood vessels of the brain 
have two functions, not just to supply the brain with blood, but also to uh, help with eliminating waste from the brain. And therefore, um, we must protect the blood vessels because you can't selectively protect the blood vessels of the brain. You have to act entirely on the cardiovascular system with the appropriate uh, protection of diabetes, hypertension and uh, hypercholesterolemia and dyslipidemia and so on. And this needs to start early. Um, and uh, the research that the British Heart Foundation is funding is exactly across this spectrum. Yes, they funded us at the end stage, which is what uh, the cause of the vascular dementia is and what targets can we find? And the answer to that question is therapeutic targets are within the walls of the blood vessels and this cement that is between the blood cells. And for, for anybody who um, had doubts about whether Alzheimer's disease has a vascular component, well, this particular consensus uh, paper has actually probably about a hundred of us contributed to it, even though um, you know, the, the paper ran out of space with the author's uh, names. Um, and we all agreed, everybody involved in this exercise agreed that actually even in the Alzheimer's brain, there are elements of vascular dementia because once the, the brain starts, uh, once the vessel starts failing, it will not fail just in one function, it will fail in both. So what are we doing about it? Well, right now we're looking to the future with a few exciting therapeutic targets. The reason that this process is called IPAD is because in neuroscience, we love abbreviations. We love abbreviations that are memorable. And this one is uh, short for intramural, which means within the wall of the blood vessel, peri-arterial drainage. So until Apple sues us, we're quite happy to use this term. And uh, our targets now are to use chaperone molecules to help the transport of proteins along these channels within the walls of the blood vessels. So one such candidate is a molecule called clustering. So we're working internationally on this from the Mayo Clinic in the US to Romania to try and, and test the effect of clustering and also to improve the pump action, the motive force for the drainage of waste from the brain, because having recognized that that, that is a problem in both vascular and Alzheimer's disease, um, we know we can act upon the walls of the blood vessels uh, by acting upon the innervation of the blood vessels. Um, and we're, we're making quite nice progress there as well. And this is a collaboration that we have uh, with, with Japan. Um, these are some of the researchers in the lab that uh, have been, uh, that were working on this project when they were um, photographed. So Matthew McGregor Sharp and Satoshi Saito uh, from Japan, he's gone back to Japan now, and Maureen Gatherer, who is our lab manager of the group. And with this, I'm going to stop thanking my uh, mentors, uh, Professors Roy Weller and AJ Verma, um, of course, my, my students, the funders, and I think you recognize the logo um, uh, that uh, is very dear to us now. Thank you. Thank you, Roxana. That was fantastic and clearly places the blood vessel you know, at the center of not just vascular dementia, but other forms of dementia as well. That's great. So I'd like to move on now to, um, to our next speaker, uh, Leslie Jackson, who has been diagnosed with uh, vascular dementia. And Leslie is going to tell us about her story with vascular dementia and, and Bill Snadden is going to support her in telling her story this afternoon. So I think that this will be a really interesting insight into the effect that vascular dementia can have on your life. So over to you, Leslie, and to Bill. 
Thank you, Professor Thank Lee. You. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Bill Snadden from the BHF Story Team, and I'm joined here today by Leslie, who kindly shares her story uh, of living with vascular dementia for the BHF to help us bring our work to life. And she has uh, joined us today to tell us a little bit about her story um, of living with the condition. Uh, so, Leslie, how, how are you doing? Hello there. Hi, Bill. I'm okay. Hello, everyone. Leslie, can you take us back to that day in 2011 when you had a mini stroke in your office? Yes. Um, as you said, I was at work. And um, this is the second of three TIAs I've had. Um, I noticed um, I had a really, really bad headache. And um, I turned to a colleague to get some assistance and they pointed out the fact that my face had dropped to one side. And um, they immediately got an ambulance. They called an ambulance and I was taken to the stroke center in um, the Houston hospital. And um, I was given really good care and treatment. Um, I was then diagnosed as uh, having a vascular dementia because there were lesions on the brain and it caused that. I was offered some um, help in the form of future, future being contacted by um, different agencies to help me to cope with it. But, okay, so um, that, um, mm -hmm. that mini stroke, the mini strokes that you had um, led to the diagnosis. Yes, yes. And can you recall a moment for us when you've been out in the world in the last while, in the last few years, and your vascular dementia has kicked in? Yes, there's been several incidents, but I, put, I can remember one vividly when I went shopping one day and um, I actually left the butchers. I was at a very busy intersection and um, <clears throat> I was waiting for the lights to change, but I mistook the green man, it was for the oncoming vehicle instead of for me to go forward. And um, it's a very busy intersection and I, I felt myself being dragged back. Someone standing behind me actually pulled me out of the road because I stepped in the road. In the road. And um, that I was really shaken. I had to find somewhere to sit and uh, call my daughters to come and get me. So that was one incident. Um, yeah. It was just your spatial awareness was. Yes, absolutely. I just thought, I agree. I saw the green to go and I, but it was facing the other direction. I mm. just didn't differentiate the, that, you know, it, it wasn't for me, for them. Mm. And Along with some of your uh, memory challenges, you also sometimes um, have trouble with steps as well. That uh, yes. awareness around you. Can you tell us a moment, perhaps, where yes. that's caused problems? I, I, when I used to go shopping, um, like certain, certain buildings are more modern that they have a slope, or but, but when, when I have a step or the, the steps aren't marked, I can, I, I, I have problem deciding whether to step down or not. And sometimes that cause falls, you know, I'm, I'm not able to, to clarify whether it is a step or not mm -hmm. in some instances, yes. And you were diagnosed with vascular dementia when you were 50? Yes, yes. And you're now... 59? Yes. And you've got three granddaughters? Oh, yes. <laughs> Tell us about your granddaughters. Sorry? Tell us about your granddaughters. Oh, they're my life. They keep me going, to be honest. Um, the eldest is um, Camelia. She's 10 years old. Um, then there's Soraya. She is eight. She will be eight in a couple of weeks. 
and I've got um, Kaylee. She'll be, she's one and a half. Yes. Okay. So, mm -hmm. And how do the oldest two relate to your vascular dementia? Well, the, they they take they take it okay. At the beginning, they just didn't. Camelia, the eldest one, is very close to me. She actually grew up with me, and um, she just couldn't accept the fact that I'm not the same Nana. Um, Saraya, she has been in the hospital from birth. She actually had. Um, open heart surgery at uh, before she was one year old. She was born with several um, holes in her heart and um, she has a syndrome which caused that. And um, she's used to the hospital environment, the masks, uh, stuff like that. So we, we talk a lot about it. She asks a lot of questions about it, dementia and what's what I'm going through. So yeah, they're they're accepting it better as we go along. Mm -hmm. The oldest granddaughter, Camelia, you mentioned to me previously that someone came to her school and spoke about dementia. Oh yes, yes, that was the highlight of her school year. Uh, someone came to the school to speak about dementia. I mean, apart from me, she had, apart from in the house, she has never heard that word. And the person came to speak to them about that, about dementia. And um, she, she could identify the fact that her Nana has dementia. She was <laughs> very proud to be able to say that. And she explained to them some of the things um, I've done and not done and not able to do anymore and stuff like that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Leslie, for uh, joining us here today. Is there anything else that you would like to add while you've got this audience? Yeah, not a problem. Um, I really I feel honoured to be to take part in this, and I try to um, make. Um, I appreciate the like the British Heart Foundation and other institutions who are engaging with the public and giving out and making it more. Um, aware and talked about, you know, so I really appreciate that. Well, we appreciate your time and um, you sharing your story, Leslie. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. So I'd just like to add my thanks as well, Leslie. It's very generous of you to come along and talk about the impact of vascular dementia on yourself, but also on your family. And I think that really brings it alive. And also to thank Bill for supporting you today. Uh, that, that's really great. Yeah. So that brings us to the end of the three uh, presentations uh, for this afternoon. Um, and we're, we're going to move on now to have a question and answer um, session. Uh, I know there's been some pre-submitted uh, questions already, uh, and we will uh, be taking those questions. So Leanne is going to help us to navigate through the questions this afternoon. So over to you, Liam. Thank you, James. And thank you, Roxana, for sharing your research with us. And thank you for Leslie for sharing your story with us. Um, I have a question for Roxana. Um, so Roxana, what are the known reasons for suffering from vascular dementia? Is stress a factor? So even though the... Um... The, 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 the has, it's very difficult to perform a mechanistic study in, and it's not ethical to, to, to perform a mechanistic study on stress and, and, and its effects. Stress, and it's very difficult to untangle whether stress, stress directly causes vascular dementia or does stress lead to a release of a hormone called cortisol that actually then interferes with uh, blood glucose, worsens diabetes, definitely worsens hypertension. And those factors we know are definitely underlying vascular dementia. Thank you, Thanks, Anna. Another question for you. Is vascular dementia hereditary? And if it is, can it be neglected before you have any symptoms? I hear you with a, a bad echo, but... Um, 
vascular dementia itself is not considered hereditary, but there are um, there uh, obviously there are genetic links to again to its underlying causes: uh, hypertension, diabetes, definitely hyperlipidemia, and um, what was the the other uh, what what was the other part of the question? Can it be detected before you have any symptoms? Um, can it be detected before you have any symptoms? Yes. Now people might be surprised to hear this, but I'm told by the radiologists and by my mental pathologists that actually um, people have mini strokes in their brains from the age of 35. So, and that's just a normal occurrence with aging. So we, what we want to do is to not worsen this process and accelerate it with smoking and, and all the other risk factors. Um, I, hi, it's Christy here. I'm gonna take over just for a moment as um, Leanne has turned into a robot <laughs> for just a moment. So I'll, I'll hit you with the next question, Roxana. Um, we have a, a brilliant question um, that's come in this week, which is, can the onset of vascular dementia be so slow that the person doesn't realize it? Yes, indeed, because it depends where these mini strokes are. So uh, we see in our postmortem brains, we see mini strokes in the brains that have been sent to us as controls. So they've been sent to us as brains that appear normal. And then you find that in the notes, it says, actually, there was a little bit of mild cognitive, it's called mild cognitive impairment. So it can be insidious, it can be very, very slow, because if the, the strokes are small, and in areas that are not necessarily uh, translated into behavioral changes immediately or, or paralysis or, or that sort of thing, then it's, it can be very slow. If it's a bigger stroke, that is say, for example, in the area of the brain that serves movement of the arms and face, then you get what Leslie has, an immediate uh, effect. Great, thank you, Roxana. We've had another question through, um, which is for you. If you have atrial fibrillation, why are you at greater risk of suffering vascular dementia? Is there a test to establish whether you're likely to get it? Okay, I'm speaking in front of, you know, the senior figure of British Heart Foundation here. So I'm coming out of the brain now to the <laughs> atrial fibrillation. So correct me if I'm wrong, but atrial fibrillation actually um, uh, makes you prone to little clots that start traveling up the blood vessels. And then, and so what atrial fibrillation is, is basically an irregular beat of the heart. If the heart beats irregularly, then the blood uh, doesn't circulate nice and smoothly through the uh, blood vessels. There's, there's a, a tendency for tiny clots to form. These tiny clots eventually block little blood vessels in the brain. And that's why atrial fibrillation is actually a, a huge risk factor for, for um, uh, strokes and therefore vascular dementia. It, but the good news is it, it can be treated. Great, thank you. And no comments from James. I'm guessing that was a 10 out of 10 answer. <laughs> on atrial Absolutely fibrillation. perfect, very, very good. <laughs> this is harder Great. than my conference with, you know, than conferences with my peers. <laughs> <laughs> so our next question, Roxana, um, is from one of our uh, attendees today. My wife has vascular dementia and regularly will sleep for 48 hours or more in one session and is often tired. Is this normal and is there anything I should be doing or can do to support? So I think this is not particular to vascular dementia. This is particular to all forms of dementia. Usually you go through stages of sleeping a lot because the brain is trying to recover. The natural tendency for any injury to, to or insult to any organ is it's trying to recover. And the brain tries to recover through sleep because of course sleep will then shut down functions that aren't necess necessary and allows for, uh, for regeneration. 
in advanced stages and because people might might have different experiences in advanced stages of dementia when a lot of the brain substance has been lost what is happening is the few neurons that are left are bombarding neurotransmitters and therefore the brain is very alert but it's not logically alert and then you get phenomena like sundowning with patients with Alzheimer's disease that start wandering around and, 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 and may become aggressive. And that's actually more in Alzheimer's disease than in vascular dementia. But in vascular dementia, it's the tendency of any organ to regenerate and recover and the brain does that through sleep. Great, thank you, Roxana. And we have um, a question specifically around ischemic stroke, which is one type of stroke. Uh, our, our, our person has asked, is it a risky condition? I know you've talked a little bit about stroke in your presentation, but if you could expand on ischemic stroke. So strokes can be either ischemic, where basically the blood vessel gets blocked, or hemorrhagic, where the blood vessel bleeds. And by far, most of the strokes are ischemic. And um, it's, it's difficult to say, is it a risky condition? It depends on, on the number of blood vessels, on, on their location. As I said, there can be tiny mini strokes, they're called, in, in very young people, and they're totally asymptomatic. What you want to do is to not allow them to repeat or to get uh, worse. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question um, from one of our supporters. My mother died recently of this horrible disease. How far are we away from any substantial breakthrough in treatment that will delay or try and control this disease, the disease that robs peoples of their lives, independence and dignity? A great question. I think that even now with all the public health interventions, the the uh, there, there is still a lot of work to do in terms of prevention. People are still smoking. People still have poor diets. Um, people are, are um, ignoring uh, alarm bells, uh, alcohol, and 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 maybe symptoms of a, for for hypertension and diabetes. Um, there is a great. Uh, study that's come out of Cambridge uh, that is very encouraging and the epidemiologist is called Carol Brain um, and she's shown that with efficient intervention for hyperlipidemia and for and and hypertension actually the numbers had started to go down. The, we, we have to balance the fact that we have an aging population so there's a natural arteriolosclerosis, the walls of the blood vessels get stiffer, can't do anything about that, that's the normal aging process, against the fact that we can intervene for the risk factors that we need to, to control. So that's prevention. In terms of treatment, I said to you that actually as a result also of the study that was, was funded by the British Heart Foundation, we as a group, and I know others are, uh, a lot closer. We didn't have therapeutic targets five years ago. My group was only working on, on, on trying to uncover the mechanisms. Now we've done that. We can, now that we know the mechanism, we have targets. If we have targets, we work with the biochemists and, and interdisciplinary work, and we can actually uh, uh, put that into action. So how far are we? I'd say, um, you know, with, with, with how fast things are progressing somewhere between five and 10 years. Thank you, Rosanna, brilliant answer. And just to feed um, into what you touched on there regarding um, prevention, we've had a question live today, which is, does vascular dementia result from alcohol consumption? Could you expand on, on the point you touched on? So, um, Yes, the answer is yes, not directly, but indirectly. So al alcohol, I'm sure um, the BHF uh, will, will support me in this, is one of the major uh, problems for the cardiovascular system, as it is for many other systems. And as I said at the beginning of the presentation, we cannot treat the brain in isolation. The brain has the same blood vessels that come 
as an extension from the blood vessels that go from the heart. So uh, yes, the alcohol is a major problem. And yes, indirectly, it is linked to all forms of dementia, not just vascular dementia. Thank you. We have had another question pre-submitted. Um, and this is, my husband has had an MRI and he's showing signs of dementia, but it said that there's been nothing found. He realizes that he does not remember things short term, even during conversation. Could there be another cause of this? Yes. So um, memory loss um, is, is such a, a common and vague uh, symptom. And it, it's not necessarily uh, attributed to dementia. Um, it could be stress, it could be lack of sleep, it could be actually a sign of diabetes and um, uh, just, just little strokes that cannot be picked up on the MRI. Not everything is picked up on the MRI. That is the problem. We can't pick everything up. We can only pick up where, where there are mini strokes that have come together in a cluster or or one large stroke but we can't pick up the 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 um every single ischemic lesion um that may lead to to uh to memory loss and actually we have to distinguish the normal memory loss of aging and stressful life from the pathological memory loss that is usually accompanied by other symptoms. It's not just memory loss, it's behavioral changes. Great, thank you. We've had a, a question live today and from David. Thank you, David, for your question. It is, I had a TIA in 2014, age 63, loss of speech function, cleared within a few hours. Does this mean my TIA puts me in on an inevitable path towards dementia? I hate to say it, but I think we're all we're 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 all at risk because the number one risk factor for dementia, I didn't want to say it, is for all of us, aging by far. But um actually it's not, it's about how severe this risk factor is. And one TIA is an alarm bell to actually just get everything else sorted. And um, for one TIA, I'm, I'm not a practicing neurologist, but I can tell you we would not be able to detect it on our brains. So. Thanks, Roxana. I just want to double check people can hear me okay. I know there's some sound issues on Zoom today. Am I all right? You have gone a little bit as uh, Leanne went. Um, <laughs> So I don't know if Leanne's um, audio is better. Yeah, I can I can check again. Is that better? Yeah, you're back oh. to normal. That's that's good. Um, so Roxana, another question for you, which is, someone said, not sure I understand how the brain creates damaging waste from blood or oxygen. Can you can you please clarify on that? Yes, everywhere else in the body there are lymphatic vessels. If we stand for long periods of time, our ankles swell up. What do we do? We put our ankles up and fluid drains. It drains through lymphatic vessels. You can even pay money and get lymphatic massages. The brain does not have lymphatic vessels. And as a result, everything it produces, if you, if you use oxygen and nutrients, for it to function, it produces waste as well. There are no lymphatic vessels and the only way out is either back into the blood or along those tiny pathways that I showed you within the wall of the vessel. So if the wall of the vessel starts becoming stiff and fatty, those channels are compromised and you start getting the accumulation of waste. Thanks, Roxana. And um, we've had a, another question come in live from Wendy Wilson. And Wendy has asked, is migraine with aura a risk factor for dementia? Now that is a difficult one because the answer is I don't know. Um, but in migraine, what happens is the blood vessels dilate. So um, probably you'd need to have quite a few recurrent migraines 
for the structure of the wall of the blood vessel to change. Um, so I'm not aware, I don't think anybody's looked actually in that. So that's, that's one topic that's worth um, looking at. Thank you, Roxana. A question from Zina Forster, who's asked, does small vessel disease diagnosis always mean a progression to dementia? No, not at all. No, small vessel disease means that the walls of all the small, of all, of all types of small vessels in the brain, so capillaries, arteries that bring blood into the brain, veins that, that spit blood out of the brain, they all undergo these changes where the wall becomes stiff, um, but stiffer than normal aging and with fatty streaks. So yes, it's a risk factor for, for, um, for strokes and it's a risk factor for, for dementia in general, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that every small vessel disease will, will lead on to dementia. Thank you. And on that, um, how quickly can small vessel ischemia in the cerebral region accelerate symptoms of vascular dementia? In the cerebellar region, I read quickly there. Um, I think I, I, whether an, it may have been a, a mistype. So the cerebellum is the part of the brain that is involved in balance and coordination. So any stroke in that area is quite serious because it's also close to the, the visual area. The arteries are, are the same and the patient will not be able to stand essentially. They can't keep their balance and usually their visual disturbances. So the, the um, how quickly and how fast and how is impossible to answer because it depends on, on what else is going on in the brain. And there is no, if there was a pattern that was that precise, it would be, it would make our lives a lot easier, but unfortunately it's not. Thank you, Roxana. We've, we've had a lot of questions coming. I'll ask a few more before we hand over to James. Um, is tau a symptom of inflammation of disease somewhere else in the body? Very good question. So yes, that is a very good question. So tau is a protein that normally makes up the uh, nerve cells. Um, so it's absolutely normal. In any kind of dementia, eventually the nerve cells die and that tau is released from the neurons and then you can detect it. So you pick it up. So wherever you have nerve cells dying, it could be in the, in the nerves that supply the gut. Then that also, and, and usually when any cell dies, the natural process is inflammation. So yes, if you detect a lot of tau, that means a nerve cell has died and inflammation is, will, will accompany that. Thank you, Roxana. One, one final question for you. Um, how did you get into this field of research? What, what drew you to, to, vas to studying vascular dementia? Um, I think it's because um, my, my so, so I, I, I teach neuroanatomy. I've been passionate about the brain for 20 years. Um, I, uh, I, from a personal perspective, um, I've got, but I've lost my father and my grandmother to dementia. And um, of, uh, we've actually seen so many elements of a vast, so many problems with the blood vessel walls in all of our demented brains that um, actually vascular dementia is so widespread. I would contradict, and I think quite a few of my colleagues would support me, that Alzheimer's disease is the commonest part of the uh, commonest form of dementia because we see vascular dysfunction in these so-called Alzheimer's brains. Um, so, uh, and it's fascinating because the mechanism is fascinating and it's just so, so motivating when you see people around you that, that, and you want to do something. And what, what can I do other than, you know, care? Yes, you care for them, but you don't resolve the problem. You have to try and find the treatment. So that's what motivates our, everybody in our group. Thank you very much, Roxana. Thank you for, Thank for you. joining us today.
And, and ApoE4 is not necessarily linked to vascular dementia, but it is linked to myocardial infarction. So it is a, a gene associated with cardiovascular problems in general. Thank you. Thank you, Roxana. Um, one question for, for James before I hand over to him to, to close the event. Um, James, research into vascular dementia is spread over Alzheimer's Society, the Stroke Association, and, and yourselves. Um, so how, how do, you, do you make sure that you know, the, the balance, there is a balance between the donations that are directed to, to that research area? I think that's an excellent question, and uh, thank you for asking it. And so it's just worth noting, you know, we, we currently fund about 10 million pounds worth of active grants in vascular dementia. So, you know, we're, the British Heart Foundation is a very significant funder of this area. But we also recognise that the Alzheimer's Society and, and the Stroke Association fund in this area. And so we co-fund some grants with them. So where it's appropriate and, and there's a cardiovascular component of, of the work, we will co-fund. And so we we currently fund about between three and four million pounds over the last five years of grants with the Stroke Association or, or Alzheimer's uh, Society. So, so that's how we, we interact with other charities in this space to make sure that the, the, the best ideas are funded. Uh, research at the British Heart Foundation is funded in what we call response mode. So we wait for uh, great uh, scientists such as Roxana to come to us with these ideas, these things that they want to test to try to solve the problems of vascular dementia. And we fund the most excellent grant applications that come to us. So within the, those applications across the whole cardiovascular piece, there are applications in vascular dementia, and we're very happy to fund those. And as I said, at the moment, we're funding 10 million pounds worth of that research uh, in live grants at the moment. So I hope that that answers the question. Thank you, James. Thank you. Um, I'll leave it up to you to, to close the event. Well, thank, thank you, uh, Leanne. And I, I, sh I should say another word of thanks to, to Roxana. I think we gave you a really good grilling uh, in, in the questions and, and excellent answers. So I, th I think thanks, thanks for your participation this afternoon. Uh, it's up to me to, to wrap up the meeting. Uh, we have a few minutes left and I'd just like to repeat the earlier poll to see how people feel about their understanding of, of vascular dementia. So that, that's come up now. And if you could just fill that in, we'll get a live poll result and we'll see uh, what we've achieved this afternoon. So no pressure, Roxana, but you know, if it comes out worse. <laughs> so the good news is that the, the, the majority of people now are at level four out of five with their understanding of vascular dementia. So thank you very much, Roxana, Leslie, and Bill for your participation this afternoon. That's been great. I'd just like to run one more quick poll um, because we're clearly we're interested in the impact of these sessions. And um, we would like to, uh, to just have a quick poll to see if you are more or less likely to support the BHF after listening to the information this afternoon. So that poll's come up now. And if, if people would like to complete that, this is very useful for us internally to make sure that we are providing information uh, in the right format. So thank you for that. And an overwhelming 87% of people saying yes. So that, that's great feedback. And that, that makes us uh, confident that we are formatting these in the right way. So just really to come on to closing remarks now, and to thank again everybody that's been involved uh, in, in today's session, and thank you for attending, asking such interesting questions, uh, and, and I think raising the, the um, profile of vascular dementia for all of us. The event was recorded, and it will be available on our website uh, within the next week or so, so please, uh, if you want to review it, do so. If you could complete the survey that you will be sent by email, it really helps us to focus these sessions in the most useful way. Uh, so please, if you, if you have a few moments, if you could complete that, that would be great. We run these sessions every month. The next one will be in on the 21st of April 
and we'll be looking there at um, health inequalities. So uh, please do uh, join us for that one. If you haven't already, please visit our website, which is bhf.org.uk forward slash public events uh, and, and sign up uh, for uh, information on, on the website. Uh, as I've said, we're interested in continuing these events and, and your input into those is really important. So with that said, I'd just like to once again, thank you all again uh, and draw this session to a close. I hope you have a good evening and we look forward to seeing you again soon at another event. Thank you very much.